and welcome to the Leading with Lean podcast. My name is Philip Holt, author of Leading with Lean, The Simplicity of Lean, and Leading Lean by Living Lean. And in this podcast, I narrate all three of my books, chapter by chapter, in which I share with you my over 30 years of experience as a lean leader across many companies globally. The Simplicity of Lean, Chapter 1, Introduction. The Simplicity of Lean. Lean means many things to many people, and its success or failure is important to a large number of stakeholders, customers, employees, management, shareholders, suppliers, and society as a whole. Is lean a toolkit? Is it about cost saving? Is it a way of thinking? Or is it a fundamental and strategic shift in the culture of an organisation? The importance of this question to each of the stakeholders might appear different, but essentially, Getting the answer right will result in each of the stakeholders benefiting in a substantial way. Customers will see their services, quality and total cost of ownership improve, while employees will find their work more rewarding, both in terms of their engagement with the work and their financial recompense. Management will experience a more engaged workforce who solve problems and improve processes daily, freeing up the manager's time to build and grow the business. Managers will practice an improved form of leadership, one that supports dynamic and effective teamwork and allows them to achieve the success that they desire. Shareholders will find that their investment in the organisation provides a superior return to that of the overall market and that the company features as one that is both sustainable and ethical. It will be one of the jewels in the crown of their investments. Finally, suppliers will find that they're valued more highly by their customer with a relationship far less focused on price and instead built around the total cost of ownership and innovation with a customer-supplier relationship based upon trust and the long term. Answering the question of what lean means is critical to its successful adoption by an organisation and one of the challenges that I find many people experience is how exactly to do this. The purpose of the simplicity of lean is therefore to help the reader to get to the right answer and to adopt lean thinking and lean leadership into their organisation. I chose the title of the book to convey that lean injects simplicity in an organisation. However, please don't misunderstand from my use of the word simplicity that deploying lean into an organisation's culture is easy, or that it is overtly simple. This is not the intention in my choice of the word. Rather, it is because I truly believe in and have experienced the simplicity that Lean brings to an organisation. Nevertheless, the approach that one must take to achieve this simplicity will require the removal of significant complexity in the organisation, both in terms of complicated processes built up over many years and the cultural norms of behaviour that will be well rooted. In fact, one of the most common mistakes that I observe organisations make in their deployment of Lean is the oversimplification of the approach that they take. As Albert Einstein famously said, things should be made as simple as possible, but not any simpler. The corollary, but not any simpler, is often omitted from the quotation, yet it is the most important part of simplicity and inherent in the thinking contained within this book. I am quietly confident that as the reader progresses through the book, they will gain the knowledge that they require to establish just how they can integrate lean thinking and lean leadership into the fabric of their organisation's culture and answer the question, what is lean? Operational excellence is a strategic advantage. It's a truism that a clear majority of executive teams have the ambition to deliver a breakthrough in their organisation's performance and that their strategy operates to this end. However, whilst there are some famous examples of organisations that really break the mould with their innovative business models, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla and Alibaba, for example. What is important to keep in mind is they are not the only innovative companies in their marketplace. Importantly, but perhaps a little too prosaically for the mainstream media, they also owe a great deal of their success to being rather good at the more mundane elements of operational excellence. In the results of research by Rafaela Sadum, Nicholas Bloom and John Van Rehaim, of the Harvard Business School, the importance of good management and operational excellence were clearly demonstrated, concluding that nobody has argued ever that operational excellence doesn't matter, but we contend that it should be treated as a crucial complement to strategy and that this is true now 
more than ever. There are many great examples of organizations which have utilized lean leadership to achieve the state of operational excellence that provides them with a competitive advantage. And this research by the Harvard Business School provides solid data confirming what many of us, many of us have known from the empirical examples. In his book, The Lean Turnaround, Art Byrne wrote about his experiences as a CEO over a period of 30 years and how lean was his strategy for the business success that he achieved. This was a great example of how the C-suite can deploy lean leadership. But while the senior leadership must be engaged, I also want to explain how the simplicity of lean is the impact that we can all make with its adoption as a fundamental way of thinking and acting. Lean leadership will deliver excellence for your organisation, but in order to do so, lean can't be what you do, but must instead be how you think and who you are. The Simplicity Model my first book, Leading with Lean, was an experience-based guide to leading a lean transformation and was intended to take the reader through their own journey of leadership development. Because of the enthusiastic feedback that I received and the many questions and requests for more information around some of the core methodologies of lean thinking, it became clear that to complement my lean leadership model, a lean practice model was also necessary. I've called this the simplicity model. And in the book, what you'll see is an illustration of the simplicity model, which shows people engagement at the top, process improvement at the bottom, and in between, four chevrons, including culture, Kaizen, projects, and Kaizen events. Whilst I introduced many of the lean methodologies in Leading with Lean, as well as the viral model for lean deployment, what the lean practice model does is to provide the lean practitioner with a codification of the lean drivers of the two key outcomes of lean leadership. Number one, people engagement. Number two, process improvement. Through the utilization of the simplicity model, the lean practitioner can navigate the initial parts of their lean journey, hopefully avoiding some of the usual pitfalls. This will make lean leadership an even more attainable goal for the lean practitioner. The simplicity of lean is therefore an anthology of the core methodologies that the lean leader will apply to affect the required change in the culture, embed Kaizen into the organization, deliver upon the transformational projects, and engender active participation of the team members in Kaizen events. Collectively, these efforts will deliver organizational simplicity through a high degree of people engagement and process improvement. Hansai. From an early age, Japanese children learn what the Japanese call hansai, a form of self-reflection to understand what went wrong in a given situation and to learn from it. From their first social interactions at kindergarten, when a Japanese child behaves in a way deemed unacceptable to their teacher, they will be asked to take some hansai time to think about what they have done wrong and then explain their reflections to their teacher, what they might do differently in the future. Whilst it could be argued that children are often asked to think about what you've done in Western society, it is much more common for the child to be told what it is that they did wrong and how they should adjust their behaviour to conform in the future. This differs from the approach taken with the Japanese school children. The habit of Hansai is probably one of the key differences between the Japanese and Western way of thinking. This may go some way towards explaining why problem solving in the form of the Deming or PDCA cycle was adopted with such sustainability by a large number of Japanese companies and resonates at every level in the organisation, from practical problem solving at the shop floor level through to Horsh and Canary at the board level. This way of reflecting upon and improving one's performance, effectively personal practice of the check and act parts of the cycle, is central to coaching leadership the fourth and final leadership style of the lean leader. For more information on that, see Leading with Lean. The lean leader must be able to both practice and teach Hansai in order to garner the level of deep reflection that the lean organisation requires. When the lean leader is able to practice Hansai as a habit, a certain freedom of action is achieved, whereby they feel free to experiment with new approaches and accept challenges without the fear of failure. It's a liberating experience. To support your development of this practice, at the end of every chapter, there is a blank page for your reflections. Hansai is an opportunity for reflecting back on oneself, one's own action, and therefore provides the leader with a few moments to think about what they have just read and how it links to their own way of working and acting. 
Therefore, I would encourage that at the end of each chapter and before reading further, you take a pen and write down your thoughts. In relation to your own way of working and actions, what are, number one, your key learning points? Number two, the changes that you could make. Number three, current problems that they would help to solve. By doing this, at the end of every chapter, you will hopefully already be practicing a key element of a lean leader, that of being a continuous learner. So obviously, as you're listening to this in an audio format, you may not have a pen and paper in front of you, but please try and reflect on those three questions and try and take that home or back to your office and, and try to write down what learnings you've got from this uh, audio book and how you think you could improve in the future your own personal way of working. And the great thing about Hansai is it very much is a personal journey of reflection and improvement, making what you're learning and listening to very much your own. Personal stories. While writing this book, I was struck by the many examples of people with whom I've worked who have really made a change in their way of working through the simplicity of lean. I therefore asked several of them to write down their own experiences for inclusion in the book. My hope is that this will help to bring the content of the book to life, the practical application of lean leadership and lean thinking into your organisation, and drive home the point that this is not just theory. I also aim to help the reader to bring together some of the content and answer the important question, what's in it for me? I hope that you not only enjoy this book, but it will inspire you to develop your own lean leadership further and to perhaps break through some of the barriers that have impeded your attempts to transform your organisation. And the final saying at the end is by Steve Jobs. That's been one of my mantras, focus and simplicity. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. Thank you.